Well, we're not apathetic. It's Friday afternoon and we've stuck it out. So clearly, the, <laughs> clearly Elizabeth was talking about someone else. Um, this uh, topic picks up a, a, on a lot of the stuff that you've been discussing. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here yesterday. I was in Zurich talking on the same thing to a very large group of institutional investors and clients. Um, it is, sorry the pun, it is a hot topic at the moment. Uh, um, it's about action, but knowing that we're at, at university, I had to add in the research, because you know, we know academics never do it. No, no. Um, <laughs> and and uh, it's, it's about something called fiduciary capitalism. Now, Bob, is he still in the room? Yes. Um, Bob talked about the CFA uh, uh, person being sort of immune to understanding externalities. Which more, more like allergic. <laughs> allergic. Well, the interesting thing, Bob, is this definition comes from the former uh, president, CEO of the CFA Institute. And I think it's interesting. And, you know, the, the Kurt Lewin, the, the father of modern uh, social psychology, uh, said there's nothing so practical as a good theory. And I think this theory um, uh, on which part of our work is built is called fiduciary capitalism, the idea that intergenerational fairness, equity, which is actually a legal requirement for a lot of asset owners, it's, it's part of their, their, their mandate, becomes the basis of the decision making and also <coughs> the focus goes to, to the thing that the CFA old person was allergic to, which is the externality. So, so we focus on minimizing the negative externalities, maximizing the positive externalities, taking an intergenerational perspective. It's very, very similar to what John Kay is talking about since he's, he's done the review, where, where, where stewardship is the key function in his, his, his mind about investment, not the stock picking. Um, and, you know, there are examples of very important people being very dot, dot, dot off about our inability to, to manage systemic risk. Um, the Queen asked this question and it took two, two years to, to get an answer back from the economists. You know, how did you miss it? Um, next time round, it's going to be much, much harder because there were only one or two or three or, you know, a handful of people who's, who were warning about the coming collapse of the, the financial markets. This time round, it's 98% of all credited scientists. It's much gonna, gonna be much harder to explain why we missed it. Um, and it's needing people in the system. You know, my, the boss of the old the organization where I used to work, Omni de, de la Croix de la Casse, the CEO uh, president of, of AXA, used a, a very colorful metaphor, which is not his style. He said that we're now playing Russian roulette with five bullets in the cartridge. Um, Hank Paulson has said, uh, it's like uh, flying a plane into the side of a, uh, a mountain looking at and doing nothing about it. Systemic risk is appearing and it's quantifiable. Um, on the left, um, and going back to my question to Sarah, a very large investment consultancy which boasts that it has or, or, or claims that it has uh, probably one of the largest books of asset owners on its as its client base has done an amazingly interesting report quantifying the risk that, that long-term asset owners face. And another uh, leading commentator, a guy called Howard Covington, has, has indicated that the, the, uh, the risk may be even higher because uh, of consideration of which damage functions to use. But we're, we're in the realm of sy systemic and quantitative now. This is not just <coughs> The trouble is, investors are also incentivizing company directors to do exactly the wrong thing. Um, when I started Preventable Surprises, I was asked why was I doing it, and it, it was the experience of actually having watched BP and watched investors not learn anything from BP, and it kind of brought home to me that actually investors are the primary enablers of dysfunctional corporate behavior today, um, and actually dysfunctional markets, long-term investors included. and and. That, that isn't my uh, uh, headline, uh, how our screwed up CEO pace makes climate change worse, but it's true. Um, and that's our challenge, in a, in a way. So because this is an academic institution, I thought I should have an equation. Um, <laughs> how are you impressed with your equation? Um, there are three parts to this equation. Uh, the first part is the fiduciary duty issue, which is to pick up on what, what Sarah was talking about, but translate it back to the asset owner, the investment manager. 
um, a, a fiduciary duty to loyalty and care to the beneficiaries, and that really has been mismanaged in, in relation to systemic risk. That there's quantifiable and systemic risk which can't be hedged or sold. There's no way to stop pick our way out of climate change. Um, there's no clever asset allocation that deals with four degrees. Um, and investors are actively exacerbating the problem through, through pay and other, uh, other approaches. Um, and if you want a really good report on this, uh, I are CCI in the States, the Institute from the, what's, what are these initials? John McCumnick's Institute, the Corporate Governance Institute. Anyway, there's some really good research about how investors today, despite all the rhetoric about long-term investing interests, are incentivizing executives to focus on TSR growth, short-term share price movements. So, our solution is fossil stewardship. Um, it's about investors acting together, large institutional investors acting together to guide the purpose of companies in relation to this systemic risk which will cause serious damage uh, to portfolio. That's all. The question is, can it be done efficiently and at, at a, in time and at a cost which is reasonable? And our answer is yes. Um, and the, the way we get to that is actually to look at one of the weaknesses of the system, which is the dispersed ownership, and another weakness, which is the lack of interest in voting, and convert those into strengths. So actually use those things which are tokenistic and generally ignored to flip, almost to kind of do a jujitsu ju on the system and get the system to be part of the solution despite itself. Because let's be, let's be honest, and I've worked in the investment system, and, and many of you will know this from all the reports you've read, we are not having much success in changing the culture of short-termism, relative returns, peer benchmarking, cap-weighted indices. These are things which have been talked about for as long as I've been in the system and decades before, and we're not making much progress, despite all the good initiatives that are around. Um, you know, it's a, it's, this is not meant to pick on any one project, but this is a huge growth of investor interest in, in disclosure and not much impact. <clears throat> that, that, is the, that is another graph. Um, it comes from Thomson Reuters using UNEP data. Just the delay since 2010 means that we have to, if you follow the orange dotted line, be doubling the rate of decrease in greenhouse gas emissions that we were planning to do before. Um, the rate that we were planning to do before was pretty pretty stretching. Uh, the guys over lunch talked about innovation. Peter Senge says there's never been a case yet where the corporate world has managed that level of innovation. Chris, uh, Clay Christensen confirms it, that this is a huge innovation challenge for which there's no appetite at the moment. So yes, we need innovation, but we need a context where that innovation becomes an imperative, not a nice add-on. Ah, um, thesis is that there are constituencies for two legs of a, of a three-legged stool. There's a very powerful constituency for divestment and also investment. The divestment bit of it is the students of 350.org, the religious community, brilliant, it's taken the agenda in a way onto the top of, of the pension fund and, and, and sovereign wealth fund agenda in a way that none of us prag pragmatic, evidence-based, intelligent insiders were able to do. <laughs> Hats off to them. But it results in uh, a problem because it ends up with coal companies being owned by sovereign wealth funds, mutual funds, and others who are, who are not really uh, amenable to any kind of influence. Um, tobacco, for example. The divesting movement, investment movement, that's the green bonds, all, all, all the interesting uh, uh, clean tech stuff that is needed and more. There's some really exciting progress. A lot of it's still about intentions to invest rather than actual investments, but nevertheless, it's, it's very exciting. The second leg, which is newer, is the, and there's a huge constitu constituency there too. That, that, that's the technofix solution, you know, the, the decarbonization, the clever strategic asset allocation, all those very interesting things that the, the geeks in the system want to get on with. And, and they're very good at it, and actually that's what needs to happen because as that aggregates, that moves, moves the techno, techno, technolo, technical people with it, because that's what they do. They love it. 
more power to them, we need more of it. The problem is, the third leg of the stool has been this tiny little thing here, which you can't see, and it's called engagement. Um, I call it tummy tickling. Um, and that's basically what's been happening up until now. It's been people having um, tea and biscuits, having a conversation, and then that's called engagement. It's not fit for purpose for dealing with this risk. So what we're talking about, and we use the, the, the phrase kind of quite cat intentionally, we call it forceful stewardship. What, what it says on the team, basically. Um, it's, it's based on investment beliefs, and we've just released a report. We have 70 leading specialists, investment specialists, and, and others, several of you actually in the room, I think, still, um, Mark and Alice and others, um, talking about what, what this means. And, and we had a, a, a week of 24-hour a day dialogue online because there were people in Australia and America <coughs> and everywhere in between. And we came up with a, a, a set of... Uh, investment beliefs and practical actions. And, and the report you can download from the Preventable um, Surprises website uh, on the home page. The practical actions are extremely practical. The first thing is declare your intention to vote in favor of systemic climate risk shareholder resolutions. It's a policy decision. It can only be taken at the board of trustees. Has no cost. Sends a big signal, just by <coughs> Second, instruct your voting advisors to be fit for purpose for those resolutions. And if you don't get that kind of service, and, and looking at the analysis of the BP resolutions, there was a big difference in quality of analysis. Um, so if you don't get the quality of analysis that you need, switch your, switch your voting advisor. They, they want to provide service <coughs> in that signal to the market. Vote in favor of resolutions to publicly report uh, robust impact assessments. The interesting thing about the BP Shell and Statoil resolutions is that 98% or more of investors voted in favor of this. Now, they may say they did it because the management approved the resolution, but the interesting thing is that precedent has been set. Why would they not want to know about the same risks in other large oil and gas companies and then other large mining companies and 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 on. And so it's going to be very interesting when this resolution appears on the Exxon and the Chevron um, AGM because the large US mutual fund managers who generally tend to vote with management will have to a good job to explain why they're not uh, voting in, in this way. Um, Howard talked about the, the low carbon business plans. Um, there is another uh, significant uh, um, uh, corporate which we expect in the next few weeks to announce that it's able to do this kind of business plan. Statoil has already committed in public to, to doing so. There is the possibility with the science-based targets that underpin the We Mean Business Coalition that this could become the norm. Show us your two degree business plan becomes a very interesting proposition. So again, very easy to ask for. Um, my belief is that most companies, most executives want to do the right thing and in the right context will do the right thing, but there are some who definitely won't. Um, you know, if you look at, say, Volkswagen, that, that, that level of dishonesty doesn't happen by chance. And so in those sort of situations, investors need to be able take responsibility for being guardians, fiduciaries of, of, their, of their members' assets and do things a bit more assertive than just the, the normal forceful. So that might be um, ask for uh, initiate a book, book and records lawsuit in the first instance. And, and, and then there's much further, many other things. Depending on whether you're an asset owner or an a, a investment manager, you can then push the signal down the supply chain in a way which is really clear. And that's been missing. Asset owners haven't really done this, with a few significant exceptions, one of which is in the room. Um, but but um, mostly asset owners have kind of taken what they've been given, and fund managers have too. The, the lack of integration from the sell side research and the credit rating agencies is just a function of the buy side not asking for it. Lastly, um, we all collectively need to take our, our blinkers off, basically. The investment industry has been very slow to get to this debate. I was talking to Nigel Topping 
uh, from the, C the CEO of, of We Mean Business, and he said from all the different constituencies, the investors have been the slowest and, and most resistant. Um, that's certainly my experience, and I think that that just needs to change. And partly, it's because we talk to ourselves too much. In the, you know, there's too much of a goldfish bowl in, in the financial community, and we need to get out more. We need to talk to scientists. We need to talk to anthropologists. We need to talk to people outside our field. And that, that was one of the real strengths, I think, of the, the um, think tank. I'm coming to the end. This is the summary. Um, systemic risk reduced is the outcome. It's cheap. It's a best practice tool. As I was saying, um, uh, John Rogers, the former CFA president in his forward, has actually said this is emerging best practice. John led the CFA Institute in that process of where best practice was being established. He kicked off the, the Future of Finance project. It has the ability, and I was really pleased to hear from Sarah that, that uh, average behaviour isn't going to be good enough. This is the best practice uh, standard for everyone, including the funds who are already doing the great stuff on the, on the uh, clever uh, ESG integration, decarbonisation and funds and, 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 and all those other things. There is a third leg that everyone has to also deal with. Um, and there's group protection. Those who do it will be protected, those who don't won't. Um, who are key players? Well, they're the fossil stewards. The, obviously, the, the, uh, the players like the Aiming for A Coalition or the AODP. The scientists and academics are really important, and I'm sure significant players here, in terms of validating which kind of resolutions are okay and which are not. A complex decision, but you know, there are, there are other precedents, and uh, I'm thinking about Norway, for example, where the Council of Experts opine on certain things. We need, we need the academic community to step forward. The commercial pressure is really, really important. The mandates from asset owners. I mean, this one, man, this one uh, pension fund in, in the um, think tank asked its actuary to advise on <coughs> its risks as a result of climate change. And that one question has triggered significant change in that um, investment uh, advisory firm. So we need the right kind of mandates um, because actually that's all the investment industry does. It, you know, it chases clients. And so if the clients are asking for the right thing, it will do the right thing. Legal action is critical. The, the, the think tank participants felt that without it, there wouldn't be change. But it doesn't deliver the real change that's needed. That's why the mandates are needed. But it's legal action, even if it fails, is considered absolutely critical. So we have the philosophy, the principles, the fiduciary capitalism, the legal duty to care and loyalty, the systemic risk. And that's quite, um, it's obvious and it's sort of, it was, it was interesting, as I've, I've been working on this subject for about 15 years, I, I set up the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change. We've all been talking about it, but we haven't really focused on systemic risk, and we haven't had the data maybe and the, and the science to back it up, but that's a, that's a really interesting thing because actually a lot of the other strategies aren't fit for purpose in relation to systemic risk. They're good, they're really important, we need to direct capital in this way and we need to change portfolio decarbonisation that way but we need the fossil stewardship. I just want to say two things. We're going to focus on fossil fuels, finance, and heavy uses, all of them. And we have three country pilots. Um, Canada, the USA, sadly the lag lagouts, and the Netherlands, which is actually, we think, going to set the, the bar for the good performance. Um, Action research is going to be a key part of this, so I really look forward to staying in touch with you after this conference to see how we can work together. Thank you, Howard.